Hey, this is David Hayter. You may know me as the screenwriter of films like X-Men, X-Men 2, and Watchmen, but you probably know me best as the voice of Solid Snake from Metal Gear Solid. And you're listening to Hawaii's number one podcast, the Casanova Podcast. Kept you waiting, huh? All right, and welcome everyone to another episode of Hawaii's number one podcast, the Casanova Podcast. I'm your host, Mikel Casanova, and today I have an amazing guest, the one, the only, Douglas Bogart of Limited Run Games, the owner of Limited Run Games. Doug, how you doing? <laughs> I'm good. Hi, everybody. I'm uh, Douglas Bogart, uh, co-founder of Limited Run Games. It's uh, great to have you invite me to Hawaii. It's beautiful here. I wish I wish that part was true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, how, how, how's uh how's uh twenty? Well, okay, how's twenty twenty one going for you? I almost said twenty twenty. Yeah, yeah, I'm still uh <laughs> writing date. I'm still writing dates the wrong way. Um, twenty twenty one's going okay. Um, got a lot of big stuff on the horizon. Um, so we're pretty excited. I think it's going to be our our biggest year. We say that every year, and then it just the things that we uh, have lined up just keep getting bigger and better. Mm. Okay, cool. I, I know you guys uh, are working with my friend uh, Seba Seba Games, so you're going to be releasing Fight and Rage physically, which I'm so excited for that. I've been, I'm I'm so happy for Sebastian to ha- finally have his game in physical release because that's oh man, he's so passionate about that game. <laughs> yeah, that, that game in particular has been requested a lot. There's a a guy in our Discord that would DM me at least once a week asking for it for like the past year and a half, and uh. We'd had it for a while, but I didn't ever, you know, obviously I can't just tell him. So when he finally free, uh, found out, he was freaking out and like all over my Twitter and my Discord, just like <laughs> thanking me. And he was like, I can't believe you did this for me. And I was like, yeah, it's all for you, man. <laughs> like, <laughs> I, I knew that he would be excited, though. It was just one of those things that like, I just, I was like, man, I wish I could tell this guy. But uh, <laughs> I'll just have to let him message me every week. <laughs> no, right. So, um, yeah, man. So, so basically, uh, we're, we're going to be diving into the show with, uh, we're going to talk about, you know, uh, limited run games, you know, you being co-founder and, uh, one of the owners of it. And then we're just going to, let's just talk story. So, so speaking of limited run games, what's the story? What's the background story? How did it come about with, uh, founding it? And, and over the last five years, how has the run been so far? I know it's been phenomenal, but I want to hear from you. <laughs> And so last October, we celebrated our five-year anniversary. We started in October of 20, 2015. Uh, Josh, my co-founder, used to run a development. Well, I guess he technically still runs that uh, development mm-hmm. side called Money Rabbit Studios. And, uh, you know, we'd just been doing contract work at that point. And then he was one day just like, hey, I got a new idea for a whole new business. Like, what if we try doing limited prints of games? Because, like, physical seems to be going away and this – Obviously, you and I are both collectors, and this seems like a great thing. And I said, sure. And a lot of other people told us it was a bad idea. And then they were like, what's your first platform going to be? We said Vita. And they were like, what the heck's wrong with you? Um, wow. But like, as soon as everything was announced, I mean, uh, and uh, we sold out the first day. Uh, like, We had Oddworld reaching out to us. We ended up working with Epic. Uh, at this point now, we've worked with Disney, um, Sony proper, like Naughty Dog, to do the Jack and Daxter games. Um, we have some stuff that I, we announced the Konami relationship, so we're doing that. Um, and yeah, and then we did, uh, June 64 with, uh, Bethesda, which was pretty crazy. So we've gotten to work with like just about everybody in the industry that we've ever wanted to work with. And it's pretty insane. Um, we have a couple more white wheels to target, but the growth that we've had since 2015 being two people, and now we're like 40 plus employees is pretty crazy. I think we're on our like fourth or fifth office. So we just wow. keep expanding to the point where we need more room. How like surreal 
does it feel working with all these companies like in the course of that's a super short time span you know with tremendous growth like how surreal is that it's pretty crazy it was uh it was a bit nerve-wracking to be honest when we first started because it just seemed like we were just kind of snowballing into like this big thing and it was like kind of hard to like just take a second and look at everything like wow look what we've done because we just we kept on going and there was no like time to slow down or take a break and mm-hmm. it feels good now that we have a team so there's more uh, delegation going on because a lot of times it was like Josh and I would wear a lot of hats and we would take care of, we wanted to be in, as involved as we could in every process. And it's, it's nice to finally be able to relinquish control and just take a look at what you've built. Um, and the big thing here is we, we try to reward our employees as best we can. Like we pay them really well. Uh, we do everything we can for them. We're uh, like, if they have any circumstances come up, we look out for them. And it's, it's great to be able to offer all these things that I was never offered in my previous jobs. And like you said, the, the partners we've had have been crazy. Like never in a million days did Josh and I think as kids, we'd get to work with star Wars. So. Dude, that's and especially like during this resurgence of star Wars, it's been absolutely insane. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, I was thinking, Cause I know you guys did the uh, star Wars, uh, the, the racer one, the, the pod racer one. And I remember playing that back in the day and I was like, I absolutely loved it. And to see that you guys have helped with the re-release of that and, and physical, you know, physical capacity has just been insane. Like that, just my mind is blown. Five years, just yeah. <laughs> that uh, Star Wars Racer was one of the games that my wife even acknowledged, which was nice. And we've done a couple of games that she's known since she was a kid that like really like freaked her out. Like I can't believe you're working on that, which was Star Wars uh, Racer and then Chex Quest. <laughs> just the most yeah. random thing that Josh kept pursuing and it eventually worked out. <laughs> you guys have done a lot of stuff with SNK too. Like, um, I, you know, Mark of the Wolves. Oh my God. That game is such a classic. And I, um, I missed out on that one because as soon as I went to pre-order, like with the minutes of God, I was like, Oh, <laughs> oh dang. Yeah. Our, our SNK, uh, really ships me great. We, uh, took a really long time to get something started just because there was a lot of red tape. Um, but we met a long time ago at PSX, probably the first or second one, the second one mm-hmm. that I went to, which is probably 2016. Um, and it was great. And Josh and I are big Neo Geo pocket fans. Um, and we would both be proper Neo Geo fans if they weren't so expensive. But uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's been great working with SNK and getting to work with all these properties that I was a huge fan of as a kid. Isn't it insane to think, like, uh, back in the day, like, for us when we were growing up, that SNK's, uh, the Neo Geo was, what, five, six hundred dollars? And back then, like, our parents were like, that's you're insane. We're not buying it for you. But, like, you're thinking about now, like, the cost of consoles now, and it's like this, the industry norm. Like, it, it's, it's interesting. And it's, you're looking at SNK, they have really come a long way. Like, I, I remember how they were booming in the 90s and then, 2000 i think 2000 2001 is when they it went through like the uh the change up in their company and then they've been on a resurgence since like they've really like king of fighters set my showdown metal slug like it just seems like it's back and i'm so happy for it because i'm like finally capcom has some competition in a lot of their you know avenues so i'm, I'm hyped i think <laughs> i think the thing that hurts the most about the whole snk thing is just that when we were younger, the uh, Neo Geo Pocket was like heavily clearanced, and they like destroyed all the cases for all the games and put them in like a multi pack, yeah. and like they were all clearanced out and like they were cheap to get, and then like nobody got them, and now they're impossible to find. Yeah, yeah, especially like I know out here in Hawaii, um, we used to have a retro store that people could go to to buy all the retro games, but like right now we haven't had anything in like 10 years. So the only thing, only way we're going to get any type of retro style games out here is if they occasionally show up at like the flea market at Aloha stadium, like that's it. There's nothing else out here. We've got two best buys in the entirety of the state, Walmart's every other corner. And that's it. (laughs) I heard from a friend though, that like Hawaii has a very large Japanese population. I would imagine they bring a lot of stuff over. It it uh the, yeah so they're uh, Japanese and Chinese are typically the majority here, um and we used to have a lot of uh, 
gaming stores, but ah. I don't know. Like it's been ten years since the last major one, which was Toys and Joys, where you could literally go there and find everything from imports to cosplay stuff and and replica swords and anime wow. and manga. Like it was the spot to go to. But since then, there's not been anything, which is crazy because there's a huge market for it here, and it's like there's no, you know, nothing is really. I mean, we have book off which is another place you can go to for stuff, but... Yeah, they have those in Japan, and I love them. Yeah, like, aside from that, I think we, we used to have about seven or eight on this island alone, then it went wow. down to, like, two within the last uh, four to five years, so... Well, we have, we have, like, one game store, and it's an hour and a half away, so... And... What? Yeah, that's why we want to open our own uh, game store, which we're planning to do either late spring, early summer, or even fall at this point. It kind of just depends how the year goes, but we plan to open the next year, and it's going to be great. We're going to offer, uh, you know, used retro games, uh, our games as well, um, have events there, and just it's going to be a very, like, 90s feel when you go and kind of call back to the, the game stores we love as kids. I'm down, definitely down to see that. Hopefully, you guys have a store here in Hawaii at some point. If not, I will go to the mainland when we can travel safely. I will definitely go and check it out when you guys open that. Yeah, it'd be awesome. So, so uh, one of the things I want to ask uh, is about like the process of working with. You know, I, I know there's certain things you probably can't delve into, but like the process of working with companies is it uh, a 50 50 if you guys reach out and companies reach out to you, or is it more like uh, you know, seventy-five, twenty-five. You guys reach out, or they reach out. At, like, what is what is like the the steps to go to, to that, or how does that process? Work? So when we initially started, it was definitely us reaching out more often. We uh, crafted a dream list of games we wanted to work with, which surprisingly now we've hit most of them at this point. Mm -hmm. um, but I remember the first PlayStation experience it was the first convention we got to go to as limited run. It was in October. Or it was in 2015, December, and we had only had Breach and Clear published. And I remember walking around with it, showing developers, like, hey, I can do this for you. Uh, and they being like, did you make this in your garage? And I was like, no, this, this is a real Sony product. Like, why would it be fake? And they were like, well, we've never heard of Limited Run. And that was kind of a big challenge initially. So it really, really helped to work with people like Oddworld and uh, Epic Games to kind of solidify us as a legit place. Um, mm -hmm. And as we've kind of grown, uh, it's definitely gotten more to the 50-50 side on terms of, like, who reaches out to who. Um, probably, like, you know, every almost every other day there's a, a new game being introduced to me in my inbox by a, a publisher that wants to work with us. Um, and, of course, they're still the ones that don't even think about us originally, and we have to reach out to them. Um, but, it, but it works out. It's, uh, it's definitely nice to know that I don't have to explain who we are as much anymore. People are kind of well aware of what Limited Run does. Okay, okay. And, and do you um, like what? What would a, a typical day for you be like? Is it super hectic, like you know, five o'clock in the morning to like you know nine p.m. at night, or is it the typical nine to five, or is it a flexible, free rotating schedule? Like, what what is your schedule? What's a typical day for you? Um, well, my end office hours are typically. Uh, 10 during COVID right now 10 to 5 they used to be 10 to 6 and at one point they were even uh home office hours and then that kind of varied um I, I tend to work at night a little as well we have some employees that definitely prefer working at night they just function better I don't know how they're still awake at like 3 a.m but uh <laughs> like working <laughs> but that that's that's how they've been trained but uh yeah I mean a typical day here is I come in I open like 20 Amazon packages <laughs> feels like that. Um, come in, we check our email, we go over the schedule, uh, kind of just discuss release plans and like what we want to do. We come up with creative ideas. Um, it's it's a pretty productive day. It, uh, it feels weird now still just because like not everyone is working in the office. We're allowing a lot of people to work from home for now um, just so they feel safe. And the ones that are in the office, we're taking precautions. Like I always put on my mask if I get up from my desk. Um, my desk is pretty far away from my co-founder who shares a room with me and then everybody else's rooms are they're either not in them or it's just one employee instead of all of them um 
So the days are a little weird now, but it's usually a pretty bustling place. People come in and we like chat about things. We have a lot of meetings uh, internally as well as externally. Um, yeah. Okay. Okay. And, you know, speaking of, you know, we're in the middle of this pandemic and everything. Has that slowed down like business as a whole overall or has, you know, like I, I've talked to a lot of people in the video game industry and it's like the adjustment to dealing with uh, not being able to fully operate to the full capacity previously has been a challenge. So how, how has that challenge been for you? you folks? Um, so when the pandemic first started, we were initially really worried about how it would affect us. Um, mm -hmm. Especially since we are a direct consumer business, a lot of our, a bulk of our team is made up of shipping and customer support. Um, but in terms of sales, we actually kind of shot up. Uh, I think every uh, game publisher and developer will tell you the same thing. It's just because people were, they needed something to do during the pandemic and game sales were going crazy. Like every time I go to Target, they're still like telling everybody like, we've been out of Switch since March. Um, yeah. And it's, it's really worked out for us. And once we were able to put in safety measures in the warehouse, uh, we were able to kind of get back to functioning relatively quick, uh, relatively normal. Like it all worked out really quickly. So we didn't actually have that much of a slowdown. The biggest slowdown we had was components when we we're manufacturing stuff. So like steel books, for example, um, because they have to be shipped, they take, they took a lot longer. And then, uh, China where we have to get some of our components from, no matter what we do, they, uh, obviously were shut down for a long time, but, it seems like the world is trying its best to get back to normal. And a lot of that stuff's working because everyone, like you said, had to adapt to this new situation and figure out how to work. Yeah. Cause I know like with a lot of companies that are having to either, you know, slow down work or delay products. And, and I, I've seen some of the fan reaction, which you know, thankfully, thankfully a lot of people are very, you know, understanding and respectful of it. But like, I've seen some stuff like uh, in the case of uh, today, I was seeing that, uh, SNK had to delay the was it the K, uh, KOF 15 announcement in season three from Samurai Showdown. Some folks are incredibly angry, and I'm thinking, in the middle of a pandemic, <laughs> yeah. I mentioned happens. Japan's having a surge in cases right now, yeah. So it's like, you know, I, I'm, I'm grateful that a lot of people are understanding, but like for the folks who don't understand, like, look, it's difficult trying to work in this type of environment, so. Well, be be some, be a little bit understanding, folks. Yeah, <laughs> I think the most frustrating thing about it is a lot of times the the reason for a delay is still COVID, but people refuse to believe, and they think you're just scapegoating. And it's like, no, it legitimately is affecting things still. Like, we might be doing okay for a little bit, but like this other partner I work with, their country might be having a hard time all of a sudden, and it's like it affects the chain of uh, flow. So it's oh, it's frustrating because it's like you can only it's like no matter what you say you're gonna lose yeah yeah Definitely. but we just we just try our best to be as transparent as transparent as possible and if we have to blame something on covid we try to specify why or where it, it took place and that's why it's happening yeah so so um one other thing i want i, I kind of want to hop over to something else and i come back to limited run games but <laughs> you are a huge fantasy star online fan okay yeah that's fair about. <laughs> Let's um, talk about that. Like, how how did that come about? Dreamcast, original. Yeah. No. Uh, so for Christmas one year, when I was in seventh grade, I got a Dreamcast. It's still one of two of my favorite Christmas Christmases ever. I got that with Grant uh, Jet Grind Radio, and I was super stoked. Uh, <laughs> and my dad was very stingy about. I mean, that sounds like such a uh, spoiled brat thing to say. My dad was very stingy about buying me games, so I kind of had to make games last. My parents yeah. were the same way. I understand. You know, I only got yeah. games on my birthday and Christmas. That was it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I had to, I had to really beg, or I had to like find work to do around the house, or like really, I don't know. It was, it was a lot of work. Um, I've, I've literally paid for games, even Dreamcast games and pennies before, because. <laughs> I know I would, the struggle. <laughs> yeah, and then and then the clerk would be like, "I'm sick of counting these. This looks good." And then um, <laughs> that happened once, and I laughed. I was like, "This worked out," because um, they could have just said no. Um, yeah, so I, I got Jigger and Radio, and I played that through Christmas as well as through January or part of January. And then Josh goes, "Hey," because uh, we were already friends at the time. I'm playing Fancy Star Online. 
I'm going to bring it over and you should, you should get into it. So I started playing it. He only had it for like a couple of days and I was immediately like, Oh my God, this is awesome. And I still have leftover Christmas money, I think. So I went out and bought a copy. And then the next day I was already past him like in level. I was like, I'm already on hard mode, dude, which was like level 20 up. And he was like, damn it, dude, I'm still trying to catch up. Like what the heck? I had it before you. But uh, yeah. And then it just kind of grew from there. Like Josh and Josh started a, a clan and we became like the second or third largest clan in the PSO days. And once Dreamcast ended, we moved over to GameCube and then we went to PC and then Fantasy Star Universe and now Fantasy Star Online 2. So we've been doing this for like the better part of two decades. And we both maxed out the hour counters on the original releases. Um, mm -hmm. It's just one of those things we love. Like the soundtrack still gets me. I listen to that all the time. I, uh, anytime I can find any merch for it, which is rare, uh, I try to get it. Um, and it's one of those things we're still trying to crack. Like we would love to make something for the series because it's definitely both our favorite. I would love to see something with you guys like working with Sega to, for for that because that would be awesome. And it's like, like how, okay, how hyped are you for Fantasy Star Online to, uh, New Genesis? Really hyped, and mainly because so when Fantasy Star Online Two came out, I knew we weren't going to get it, so I played the Japanese server for a while. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't the same. It felt like I was being, I was playing something that clearly wasn't meant for me because I couldn't read everything, and I stopped. And then now Fantasy Star Online 2 is out and like they're doing the best they can, but there's so much content and they're doing it so fast. It feels like we're playing catch up. And every time I get like, you know, the best gear, it's like the next day my gear is already outdated. And it's like, Jesus, like I, it's like really hard to keep up with all the content. So this new release is going to be great because I can start with everyone. And like the graphics look really good because that's another thing about Fantasy Star Online 2. It came out like eight years later, it feels like. And it just, it doesn't look like it would normally for a new game. Um, so yeah, it's going to be great to finally start again with everybody else. Like I got to with PSO and fantasy star universe. Do you think that the, the model that they're going with the free to play model works in the benefit of fantasy star online, or do you think it would be better if they went with something like wow, or the final fantasy 14 model of an MMO subscription? So I've never understood the argument against subscription models because I've always just sucked it up and paid it, and I've never had a problem with it. It's like it's like ten or fifteen dollars a month, and I usually forget I even had it come out of my bank account. Um, even when I was like broke all the time, it wasn't that much for me to just consider. It was like you know maybe a couple trips to Taco Bell I just couldn't take that month. Um, mm -hmm. So I don't mind subscription. Like I still play Final Fantasy fourteen, and that's been taking money out of my account since twenty thirteen. Um, even though I barely play it now, it's they're still making money <laughs> off me. But that being said, PSO2, in my hype for that game and love for it, I've already put in like a couple hundred dollars on like AC cash, as they call it, in-game cash. So I would say that it works for them to be free-to-play because people like me are still being suckers and buying that stuff. And they're making infinitely more money off me than they would have if I just had a subscription. Okay. okay. And I think they're probably still burnt by the subscription thing from the original. Because it ended up back then, people weren't up to the idea of subscriptions, and yeah, console gaming was in its infancy, and nobody really understood how it worked, and like it was just it just made things more harder. And I think Sega at that point was like, you know what, let's kill this, and I don't know, the free to play model is working for them. Okay, okay, yeah, I'm definitely looking for. Oh, go ahead. I was, I was, I was going to say, I'm still, I'm also okay with free to play if the paid items are mostly cosmetic. Okay. Yeah. Because then it's not. Then, oh, sorry. One more time. I was no, going to say no, that. No, no, no. And then in that case, it's not pay to win, which is the only thing I don't really care for. That, that's one of the things, like, when it comes to a lot of MMOs that I see, like they're free to play, or even, you know, the whole thing right now, the, the Fortnite style games is if it's cosmetic, I'm fine with it. But if it's like a grind just to do, get, you know, to be able to compete on any level that's why i have an issue with it but i like the model that uh you know fantasy star online 2 uses i just feel like like because i i play final fantasy 14 full time like that's my full-time game that i stream and occasionally i'll go back to fantasy star online 2 i need to beat stormblood but, still so <laughs> oof, dude i'm okay so speaking of stormblood right 
So that's where I'm at now. So I've been off and on with 14 since. Oh, so you're like uh, me. Yeah. I've yeah. been playing since the, the beta, and like I didn't beat Heaven Sword until a year after it came out, even though I bought it on day one. And, and I just like. Do, do you feel that like Stormblood's just kind of a, a slog coming off of Heaven's War? Because I'm just not into the story. I actually liked Stormblood more going into it, but my biggest thing is I get really bad anxiety when I get thrown into a duty uh, oh. <laughs> uh, because. I don't know why I still play as tanks, but it's really stressful to be a tank. And like, I feel like if I if the team loses, it's my fault, even though it's probably the healers. So like, I don't finish quests because it'll be like, oh, you have to queue up for a dungeon now, and I'm like, oh god, and I start panicking, and then I'm like, I'm just gonna log off. I'll come back for the seasonal event. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I didn't finish Stormblood, and it was really cool at first, and I thought the bad guy was super awesome. Like the statue you got of him was cool. Yeah. But then I didn't really play it again until the next expansion came out, and then I can't even access that content until I get through Stormblood. So it has been the slog. So you win. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I, I I play a tank too, and I just recently switched over to being a Lollafell. So like I get a lot of anxiety because now I get more crap not only for being a tank, but, but for being a, for playing as a potato or a Lollafell. And it's like, oh man, like any the slightest thing that goes wrong it's your fault it is and i <laughs> i've been playing tanks since final fantasy 11 and i don't know why i keep picking that class because i hate it but it's like all i know so i just <laughs> i don't know maybe secretly i like the pain no we we, we must be saddest <laughs> yeah because I, I do that in other games too it's like i just i pick the tank class because it's like oh i'd rather i also want to know that if i'm soloing i can probably handle it myself as a tank mm-hmm Whereas, like, if you get attacked as a DPS, you might die. So I don't know. True. So, so you say you, you uh, used to play Final Fantasy Eleven. So, did you? Were you ever one of the people that play Eleven and WoW? Or I tried to play WoW when it, not when it first came out, but a few years after, and I played it for a day and said, "This isn't for me." I, I, I just had a lot. I haven't tried WoW, but like a lot of my friends, it's either they're in one camp or the other. A lot. It's really rare to see someone who plays. Them. So, to be fair, I uh, back in the uh, classic Blizzard days, I was more of a StarCraft fan than Warcraft. So, mm-hmm. I always said I would play a World of StarCraft if they somehow figured that out. But I just the medieval setting for me in Warcraft didn't do it for me. And then when Final Fantasy did it, it was like, oh, it's classic Final Fantasy. It's just it's characters I've known from all the games before, like, you know, species-wise coming back. So it was all familiar territory, whereas, like, Warcraft, I didn't play the RTS games as often as I did StarCraft, so it was all, like, weird, and I just... I don't know, it also had, like, a cutesy art style, which I didn't really care for. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know, and I was also one of those kids that was like, I'm not going to do what's popular, so I didn't want to play WoW for that reason, too. Um, which was a stupid way of thinking for a lot of things, but in that case, it worked out. Because I don't know, if I had gotten in a WoW, I may have been one of those people that like lost a lot of my life. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, we, we, we've all been there, man. I was the same way when I was a kid. Like I was counter to everything back then. It's like, you look back on it now, and it's like, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so speaking of, um, speaking of like, uh, you know, us being younger and whatnot, like, let's talk about your history with gaming. Like, what was, like, I know Dreamcast is one of your favorite platforms but like what is like your history with gaming like what was that moment where you're like this is something i love like i love gaming like what was that like walk us through that <laughs> so my earliest earliest childhood memory is playing uh super mario brothers on nes at my cousin's house um mm-hmm. i remember being really into it and being mad that we didn't have one but my first like oh my god i love video games moment was christmas when i was like five years old uh and it came, I had a Super Nintendo with Super Mario World packed in. And I just became enamored at that point with video games. And I remember I destroyed Super Mario World so quickly that I traded it for with the girl across the street who had uh, Zelda Link to the Past, mm-hmm. which took me way longer to beat. I had to have help. Uh, <laughs> but I remember at that point, I was just like, my dad and I have a weird relationship. And even as a kid, he didn't really spend a whole lot of time with me, but he would play Star Fox with me and like Gradius. Um, Mm -hmm. And I just remember being, and he taught me how to play Doom at, uh, he used to work at like the CDC and every computer back in the nineties had Doom on it, uh, no matter where you sat. And uh, 
I learned how to use DOS and play Doom that way, and it just, I don't know, it just, there's a lot of happy memories with gaming, and like, like you said earlier, like, PSO for me was a very big, like, childhood friendship thing I had with Josh that we, like, established, and yeah, I don't know. I have very, very fond memories, and games have just gotten me through so many like bad parts of my life. Like, if it wasn't for the escapism that games offer, I just I don't think I would have made it this far in life. I would have, I don't know. I lost it. It just as dark as, dark as that sounds. It's just games have really helped. Oh, I I fully understand that. I I um, you know, especially for me, like I can say like gaming has helped me tremendously like so i'm originally from uh western samoa so i uh grew up in samoa and then up until i was seven and i came to the united states and you know i didn't really speak english that well and i struggled with reading so i have dyslexia and gaming actually helped me get through that especially with playing rpgs what we call final fantasy 2 and 3 four and six like that helped me learn to read and have a passion for you know science fiction and fantasy you know going into the star wars games like just opened up so many worlds for me and then different things like i'm going through rough times gaming was always there it's like that one good friend you got that's always there for you so it's uh you know i i completely understand you know i i don't know where i would be without gaming it's it's really hard for me to imagine you never being able to speak English well. A lot of people say that. They're like, you don't sound like it. I'm like, I've learned how to mask my accent. <laughs> it's, it's it's infinitely better than what I can, what I how I speak, and I've supposedly been speaking it my whole life. <laughs> so good job on that. Thank you. Thank you. So um, that that was another thing my parents noticed too, is uh they used to read me books before bed and I they said one day I just started reading back to them. You know, which part of that is going to be familiar, being familiar with the words, but they said I would read things that they've never read to me before. And I still think it's because I played games. Um, because you eventually kind of have to learn how to read to get through some of them. And I played a lot of, like, text-heavy games back in the day, and I think those really helped me with uh, developing some skills as well as, like, creativity. Yeah. And like you said, it, it opens the door to other mediums that you never thought about. Like, you know, maybe I like to read books more, or comic books, and, like, all these other things. It just kind of, like it grows and uh into into something more it's 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 nice isn't it insane to think that like gaming and just nerd culture like from where it was back in the 80s and 90s to where it is now how it's just, it's mainstream i never would have thought it would have been what it is now like comic books like the comic book superheroes becoming like mainstream, you're seeing them everywhere. Everyone's going to the Marvel movies and the deep kind of DC movies lately. But you know, it's it's would you have ever thought gaming and nerd culture in general would ever be what it is now? Back then, I definitely, I definitely hoped it would, but I, I can still recall plenty of times where I was made fun of for being in the video games or nerd stuff. Like, uh, I was never a huge, like. Oh, I love anime fan, but I, I did love like Dragon Ball, which is evidence behind me and Gundam and all those other ones. And that was something I definitely had to keep secret with a lot of people in like high school because it just wasn't cool to talk about it. And like, or being into comic books, it's like when I played in punk bands, you just didn't talk about like nerd stuff. And then, you know, now all these people that I used to play at bands with like work at comic book shops. And it's like, that's something I never knew about this person because nobody would ever talk about this stuff. It was like not cool to talk about. So. I definitely never saw it getting to this way, but I had always hoped it would. I wanted it to be normal. I uh, I never understood going to a friend's house, and I'm like, you go into their room, and they don't have anything like pop culture. And it's like, you know, on one hand, it's like, oh, good, they're not a sheep. But on the other hand, they're like, oh, I like sports. And you're like, well, there it is. And then, uh, <laughs> yeah, no offense to anyone that likes sports, but I just couldn't just be all sports or be the regular guy. I had to have, like, a, I don't know, a, a nerdy uh, medium to go to. I just, I think also the escapism really helps. I think those of us that maybe had uh, rougher childhoods or just were bored, it helped a lot. And we didn't fit into the norms of just like going to, you know, baseball practice every day. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, so you said played in bands. I want to know, walk us through that. What, what, what uh, instrument did you play and how long have you been into music? So, 
I mean, I've always liked music since as early as I can remember, but I didn't start playing music until... So I went to school in Atlanta, and uh, mm-hmm. in Atlanta, they had a curriculum in fourth grade where you could... You had to leave part of language arts to either join band or orchestra. So that immediately caught my eye because it meant I got to skip part of class. So I said, I'm going to sign up for uh, one of these. And then my friend was like, I'm going to go to orchestra. And I was like, I'll go with you. And then they were like, what instrument do you want to play? And I was like, which one will always need a chair no matter what? So I picked the cello. And uh, I played the cello from fourth grade through high school, kind of as an easy credit. I uh, definitely hit a prime at one point, but decided to focus on uh, skateboarding and uh, guitar at that point. And yeah, then that that bridges to guitar. At one point, I started learning guitar. Uh, I played in a band with Josh. He picked up um, electric bass. Um, He had been in band as well. He played trumpet. So. Mm Yeah, I just kept doing that, and then after high school, I was like, I'm going to make it big one day in the music scene, playing in punk bands, and tried that as long as I could, and then one day it was just like, all right, I'm getting old, and this isn't working, so I, uh, but yeah, I learned how to play multi-instruments. I, I can do, like, pretty much anything with strings. I just can't really do anything that requires your hands to do something different, so, like, drums are really hard for me, and piano is really hard. Like, I just can't get my hands to separate that. It, it's, it's, it's it's a real like so i i can play piano on a basic level but like i've seen people just it looks like they're possessed like some of the things that they're doing i'm like i look at that because i remember going to like uh you know i I grew up in tennessee in in memphis so not that far away from well not that far georgia it's it's like above me so like literally went through the same thing um and i i i played uh I did violin, which I didn't want to do, but my mom was really adamant about me playing it. She's like, you got to play that. You got to do that in piano. And I was, I sucked at piano and I had a, a music teacher that every time you messed up on piano, they hit your hands. And I was like, okay. It's a different time. <laughs> yeah. That would not fly now, but like. I'm jealous you got to learn piano though. You got to read uh, treble and bass. I can only read bass clef, like guitar and I, I can't read music if I hear it like oh, so yeah I play so I play guitar like uh guitar and bass and I can do a little basic drums but like if I can hear it I can emulate it and improvise from it but reading it and that was another thing I always got scolded in, in music class for is like everyone would be doing something I'm like all right so uh all right let me find the rhythm now just go along with it. Let me fade to the background. <laughs> I remember uh, one of my favorite orchestra memories. I think it was like junior year of high school. I was uh, clearly not caring about whatever piece of music we were supposed to be learning. And I was miming the song. And the teacher instinctively yelled at me for playing the wrong note. And I just kind of looked at her and looked at my fellow cello players and was like, I'm not actually playing, so it's not me. Like, <laughs> I- I'm just pretending. Like, that bow is not touching the strings. So... I don't know if you're looking yeah, at my, like... yeah, <laughs> like that sounds not coming from this cello. I can tell you that right now. I'm pretending. I, uh, but yeah, I, uh, same thing. I can, I can hear most music and learn to play it myself, but I, I can't read things that aren't bass clef. Even then, I don't think I remember each note on the bass clef anymore. So yeah, but piano was one I wish I had stuck with. My grandma tried teaching me that and she was really big into games. Like Sonic was her favorite video game. Um, she tried to teach me, but I uh, I didn't stick with it, and then we just stopped visiting her as much as, as time went on. So I didn't really uh, stay focused. Yeah, like it's just crazy. Like thinking back to that time where, like, you know, rock music was alternative rock was, you know, soaring popularity, and then skateboarding. God, like I remember skateboarding all. I used to get in trouble so much. I I would go to like the the skate park, and my mom like, as soon as I get home, she's like, "Where the hell have you been?" Skate park. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, see, I'm jealous. I uh, I was really good at skateboarding, like normal techniques and just like all in, but I do not trust myself to go down any ramps or uh, or half pipes or bowls or whatever you call them. I uh, just not not for me. I I was basically a street skater. I hung out like. Kroger parking lots, and for those who don't know what Kroger's are, they're uh, mm-hmm. the grocery store that's now owned by Harris. Te- well, actually, Kroger bought Harris Teeter, 
and that which it doesn't make any sense. And then they renamed really? all the Kroger stores Harris Teeters. Really? Yeah. yeah, Kroger bought Harris Teeter, and then they renamed Kroger's Kroger stores Harris Teeters. It was like, why would you buy some? I guess the name had better value, but uh, yeah. And for people that don't know what that is, it's like Food Lion. If you don't know what Food Lion is, it's like Publix, one of those grocery yeah. stores. <laughs> wow. I see. Yeah, I, how long I haven't been <laughs> been back. <laughs> I didn't know that. Wow. Yeah, South, Southeast is uh, a lot of Harris Teeters and Publix now. Is. Piggly Wiggly still a thing? In North Carolina, Piggly Wiggly is more of a coastal thing. Okay. Like, and then like Win Dixie, I think is like actually gone. Then we have Trader Joe's, obviously. See, Trader Joe's is everywhere except for Hawaii. <laughs> I get so mad. It's like we okay. So here's the thing about Hawaii: like we barely have like I think we recently like two years ago we got Sonics, which is like. That's been around forever. And we just got Olive Garden. Oh, now you pandemic. can have all the breadsticks you want, finally. Right? And it's like, we, we only have one, so then you get people to travel from all the other islands to go to the one here. And it's like, we're... Sometimes I feel like Hawaii is like, the, like an afterthought. And I understand, like, we're so disconnected from the rest of the U.S., but it's like, we get stuff so late. Like, I wish we had a micro center here because all we have is Best Buy. They barely ever have anything in stock. So does Amazon do Prime shipping in Hawaii? Okay, so that that's another thing. Um, <laughs> Prime shipping doesn't make a difference out here because anytime <laughs> you you order anything, it you, like anything from Amazon, if it's Prime, you're still gonna get it within one to two weeks. Oh, they're just like, you might get it sooner, but it's yeah. not. Wow. It sounds like Hawaii is one of the places you live for, for the beauty, and that's it. Like, you just, you have to accept that you're going to get everything after everyone else. Yeah, you, you definitely have to. And and if you're trying to, like, so, like, with the whole thing with my computer, I was telling you before we started recording, like, my computer just straight died, and I took it to uh, Best Buy Geek Squad to see if they could do anything with it. They couldn't do anything, so it's like, a lot of people are like, oh, so Miguel, you're going to build your own computer? Like, I know how to build computers. It's just trying to get parts because of, you know, shipping laws out here, like certain things you can't ship here or like you try to go on Amazon or whatever site to order it. The minute they see your zip code and you're in Hawaii, they're like, yeah, we can't ship that to you. So I'm <laughs> like, OK, it's, it's kind of like the whole thing with like the uh, like I recently got the uh, Marvel versus Capcom arcade one up cabinet. You can't. Oh those and have them shipped here like literally you need to have to find it at best buy or walmart or target if they don't have it your sol but like the marvel versus capcom one we never got it out here and then i i think i i had tweeted about it and then next thing i know rk went up at like they dm me like oh what's your address blah, blah, blah. and i gave it to him the next thing i know boom it's like oh that's awesome <laughs> <laughs> they, sound, they sound like nice people. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, we have that machine in the office. It's great. It's man, that's that's my childhood right there. <laughs> I uh those are games that I always thought I was good at, and then I would go online or play against somebody and was like, nope. <laughs> Same with like just Street Fighter in general. Just never worked out for me when I went online. It's it's so weird like seeing these these fighting games like the the whole culture the, the FGC that's been built around them now, and I, I talk to a lot of people that play fighting games now, and I'm like, oh, what's your 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 first fighting game, or you know, you know, w which one do you love most? And a lot of the people that are like pro players now just got into it with Street Fighter Four, and it's it blows my mind. I'm like, yo, I got into it back in '91 in the arcades when I'm standing on the milk crates and I'm throwing the quarters in. So it's crazy, like having it, it's like it feels like it's just different generations of people that play fighting. And I, th I guess gaming in general. And a lot of times, like, cause I'm in my thirties now, I feel old when I talk to a lot of the, the current gamers now there or the, the influencers now that are really heavy into gaming. And they're like, Oh yeah, I started with this game on the 360 or started with this on the, the PlayStation two. And I'm like, 
okay. <laughs> I there was uh, okay. <laughs> I think there was like a Twitter chain going around that was like list four games that came out when you were when you turned fourteen. And some one of my followers listed like Vita games, and I was like, dude, those just came out not long ago. Like, how young are you? Like, I don't know. It's crazy too when you meet people that are like, oh, my first console was the 360 or the GameCube. Even you're just like, wow, I'm so old. Like, yeah, that's several generations after I started. Because yeah, when we, I'm in my 30s as well, and like when we started gaming, it was like there was only a couple generations behind us. It wasn't like. Like what kids experience now, which is why there's such a resurgence and it's harder for us to get games is because they're all discovering games that like their parents or uncles or family play that we like us. And then I don't know, it's just crazy to think about. Yeah. It's like, I know um, like a couple of uh, YouTubers I know they're like cover like retro gaming and, and even modern games like one uh, Jay's reviews. He's really popular with his Mega Man X series of, of reviews. And I'm talking to him and talking to Retropolis Zone. And I was like, I had a conversation with him and I was like, oh, so when, you know, when did you guys get into it? They're like, oh, 2015, 2016. I was like, oh, that's when you first started playing it? They're like, yeah. Huh. I'm like, oh, how old are you? Oh, I just got out of high oh, or they I think they just got out of high school or in college or something. And I'm like, Whoa. Wait, when were you born? About oh, two thousand. That's uh, a. <laughs> I feel like kids are, or like just people in general are spoiled now with games because like, there was a thing called like rent proofing your games, like making them hard, so hard that like it took you forever to beat it. And like nowadays, people are like, "Oh, I'm moving on, and I'll just play a different game" because they have like hundreds of choices. Whereas like we didn't have that many games coming out back then. Yeah, and like, that our parents or like whoever was in charge of getting games weren't just spending money like that on video games it was still like a a niche market and an uphill battle to convince people um because god there's so many like horrible games i remember just playing non-stop just because i was like this is all i'm getting for a while like yeah i, I made my bed asking for this so i might as well sleep in it do you remember when we had we would have to like research games as much as we can with like Game Pro Mag well, Game Pro EGM yeah. Next Gen? <laughs> like you had to look into that game. Is it worth it? Because you had like one or two shots, and that's it. That's all your parents are gonna get you. <laughs> that's that's another bizarre thing is uh, working in the game industry now and being part of like you know limited run games is like I've worked with so many people that wrote articles for like Game Pro and EGM and OneUp.com. What? Yeah, and one of them is actually an employee of ours now. <laughs> he went by the Milkman. Yo, I, J, uh, James Milk. Yeah. Oh man, I knew. Yeah, I, I was. I was looking at that before. I was like, that can't be him. And then I yeah. saw. I was like, oh. <laughs> Dad, another guy freak out because he was like, uh, he worked at Twitter and was. He got me verified and was like, is there anybody else you think should be verified? And I was like, well, there's this friend of mine who was a journalist and he just started working for us and his name's James Milky. And he was like, holy shit, is that the milkman? And I was like, wow. He has like <laughs> such a, he has a, he has a reputation. And he was like freaked <laughs> out. And now they're like good best buds. So. Man. Like, yeah. I, that's crazy. <laughs> our, Sony, our Sony account manager, Shane Bedenhausen, used to write for game for games journalism. And, yeah. <laughs> Mark Mark McDonald, we work with. He was he wrote like some of the Fancy Star Online articles we read as kids. It's pretty crazy. It's like that whole group is all. Jeremy Parrish works for us, and like yeah, <laughs> it's wild having all these people that I like. I have so much respect for because it's like your stuff was like you know the definitive source for me as a kid for game knowledge. Like there weren't that many game websites back then. There weren't, dude. That so, that's that that is like what influence. Like their work is what influences me. Like and in how I like when I work with companies is I I do you know I'm a full time content creator. So I do reviews for a lot of games. I work with a lot of companies. So my style of reviews was heavily influenced by that. Dude, that is awesome. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad I'm glad you recognized all of them. Yeah, it's it's been great. It's. It's weird when they're coming to you for advice sometimes because it's like I like read you as a kid, but you know it's really flattering that you're asking me for my opinion. Um, and it's just it's been great. And like 
James has been especially like really helpful and Jeremy Parrish as well. Like they, they, they both kill it. So. Awesome, man. Awesome. The, uh, one of the things like I definitely want to ask you, like going back to like the, the gaming industry, like we're, we're seeing this shift within, I guess you could say like within the last six, seven years, it's been slowly shifting towards digital. Like even now when you buy a game, it's mainly just a DRM disc basically. Um, do you think we're going to get to a point where we're not going to have physical media or you think that we're always going to have physical media? I think inevitably there's no stopping the digital future. Inevitably. That could be really far off though. I think PlayStation may go another generation or so without switching up digital. They're definitely with the digital PS5 uh, experimenting. I think Xbox is eager to get rid of it, and I think Nintendo will stick around as long as they can because they uh, very much value store shelves and just toy 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 merchandise in general. Um, that's a big part of their audience. So I think there will always be some, but not not always, but for a long time there will always be something. And I think uh, the way you're seeing like all these like indie game devs show up and publishers and like the way vinyl kind of resurged, I think at some point people are just going to start creating like more and more retro consoles and like redoing things and like making new games that play on retro. Like you have, it's already happening. Um, so like it's, there's always going to be an availability for something physical at some point. It might just not be like the major platforms. They might one day phase it all out, but I think people are always going to want to be able to own something physically because it means something more. Definitely. Definitely. Um, and speaking of which, like, with the the advent of limited run games and you guys' five year amazing history, there've been a lot of competitors that have popped up as well. Like, I, and I feel, in my own opinion, my my opinion, you don't have to agree. Uh, I do feel that a lot of companies uh, have been inspired or even influenced by, or some even copying what your guys' formula has been. H- how has that been? Have you ever had to talk to or work with competitors or? Yeah, I mean, so, you know, when we first started out, we were obviously very defensive of anybody else coming to do what we're doing. Um, Mm -hmm. um, But I would say we're very civil now. It's, you know, when we first started off, we were definitely a lot more reactionary than we are now um, because we've grown and we see that, like, we have lasting staying power. And a lot of these people that think it's just the easiest thing to do have already kind of fallen off the map or, like, they don't even exist anymore. Um, and there's a few that I like genuinely think they're doing a great job. I obviously don't want to self-advertise any of them, but they know who they are. And I, uh, there's only so much we can do. Like, there's a lot of games that I love, but if I say I'm going to do this game physically, our audience might be like, "Why did you pick this? This doesn't make sense." And it's like, it it would do better. It would alienate our audience, but it might work better for another company to do. And again, there's the, the massive amount of games that come out nowadays. There's just no way like Women Run can do it. Um, there's just too much and that we already, our customers already think we do a lot. And I feel like we're at a good pace now. Um, and having these other competitors pick up games, it gives people more options. So yeah. it works out. And I, you know, it also keeps us fair as long as, you know, nobody's being cutthroat about it. Um, all, all of us are trying to, you know, do what's right by the developers for the most part. There's a couple companies I know of that are, I have seeing glances of like what their deal terms are. And I don't agree, but you know, it all is what it is. Yeah. When runs doing the best we can. And I think people know that. So yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. it's been interesting. I, uh, I welcome the challenge, you know, it's fine. I, you know, asked me four years ago, I would have been like, they better stay out. But it's, <laughs> <laughs> that was back when I didn't know how long we would last. And, uh, cause this whole thing was like a gamble. Originally we didn't, we weren't sure. Yeah, like it, it's um, it's interesting when you're the the pioneer and you're the first to do something, and then you see a lot of people that come along that imitate what you're doing. There, there is gonna be that defensiveness because it's like, well, there's that sense of ownership, you know, like I did this, like or we did this. You're copying what, I, and trust me, I I fully understand. <laughs> I fully understand that. I would say um, that's the only time it hurts is like if we get somebody that comes out the gate gunning for us or they don't acknowledge 
that we started this, they'll be like, oh, we're doing a brand new thing that no one's ever done before. And we're like, we've been here for five years now. Like, what are you talking about? That's the only kind of stuff that really irks me is when people like just try to pretend we don't exist or they're coming after us. And it's like, why would you want to come out the gate making us your enemy? Like, we don't, we're not out to get you. Like, we don't, we don't care. We just want to make games for people because we're having fun. So, yeah. <sighs> <laughs> it, it, it's weird how people have that approach. Like I, I see it all the time, like in the, the content creator sphere, which I, I try my best to just look at it, step back. Cause there's a lot of, a lot of interesting things in the content creator sphere. Uh, but when it comes to like, uh, specifically what I can speak to, like with podcasting. So like I've been doing this podcast for, like I said, like four or five years. You know, I, metrically been the number one podcast for about four and a half almost five years and there are other podcasts especially out here in hawaii that are popping up and they take offense like how dare you say you're number one blah, blah, blah. and i'm like well here's the metrics Here you go. <laughs> it's, it's a fact and it's like they, they take offense to it or they come out of the gate they're trying to compete with me or they want to not acknowledge and i'm over here like well the only one i'm competing with is me I'm not competing with you. Um, it, it, it's, 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 I, un, I understand that because I, I used to be very reactionary about that too. It's like, oh, okay. And then there are other podcasts and creators I've dealt with over the last several years that like I'll do something or I'll reach out and interview somebody. And next thing I know, they're doing the same thing. Like if I, there was one point, this is actually really recently, um, last couple of months actually where the i had five or six guests in a row like this different genres but specifically five to six guests and i had two other podcasters literally copy what i was doing and have the same exact guests in the same exact order and i'm like what the wow hell are you doing I mean, <laughs> like, we, <it> can't be. <laughs> we, we've definitely seen that we uh when we first started, we would do stickers and postcards with all our releases, and then everybody did that, and we are like, Jesus. So then we moved to trading cards. Now everybody does trading cards, and it's like... Right? So we were like, you know what? It's No matter what we do, somebody's just going to do it, and then be like, oh, it was an original idea. We didn't copy anybody, and it's like, okay. But uh, at the end of the day, you just gotta, you just got to realize everybody's going to want to do what's best and what's selling, and you just have to make sure that what you offer is the best and try to stand out and... I think, like you said, your metrics show that you're doing it. So it's, it's the same with us. We just try to remain as humble as we can and do the best we can and just try to ignore all these other people. And just, I mean, we're doing this because it's fun for us. Like, you, you actually care about games. Not that the other people don't, but like, we are gamers. Like, we're the people that would wait outside for the next Amiibo launch or, you know, midnight releases. Like, we were there, like, mm -hmm. lining up. We uh, sat in my car for like, two days waiting for the PlayStation three when it launched. Like I even got the flu because of that. <laughs> so dude, me too. <laughs> I was really sick. I was surprised no one else in the car got sick. I don't even know how I got it, but I was really sick for a while. Do, do you think that, um, that's going to go away? Like the people lining up to get stuff like for us, like, I don't know. Midnight releases used to be huge. Now it's like, uh, we're going to go off of this time zone, and then here you go. You can go just pick it up. Like, I remember PlayStation 3 camping out for that, 360, the Wii. I remember you couldn't get a Wii for, like, what, two years? Yeah. Every mom, <laughs> or every mom is buying it up. They still have them. Yep. <laughs> I, I had a kid in one game. <laughs> I had a kid mow my yard, and I was trying to impress him that I work in the game industry. He's like, we're not allowed to have games. We have a family Wii. And I was like, jeez. <laughs> I was like, how, how old is that thing? Because you're young, and you must have an older sibling. But uh, I, I, I totally see what you get. I was kind of wondering that, too. I would go for midnight releases and find out they actually opened the doors at 9, and they were just like, whatever. Like, come and get it yeah. any time between these hours. And it's like, I don't know, it was such a bigger deal. Like, I remember I went to the Halo 3 opening, and they were giving out to the first, like, 100 people online, like, inflatable chairs of Master Chief. Mm -hmm. And like I had that thing in my closet forever because I was like, I'm not pulling this up. But uh, yeah, they just don't, it's not as special anymore, and it's kind of sad. And I think especially after the pandemic, it's going to be even like yeah. more rare that they do this kind of stuff. Definitely. Um, 
Uh, I I know you guys recently did the uh, Ease Origin, you know, uh, limited run edition. What was it like? Um, because you guys worked with Dot Email on that, and I know my friends over at uh, Digital Emailists they were promoting it heavily. Really good friends with them. Oh, um, you know them? Yeah, that's yeah. a good friend of yeah. mine. Yeah, <laughs> I know he really. Talks, <laughs> he talks to me on a daily basis. He even sent me a Christmas gift. He's a he's a good guy. Yeah, so same here, same here. He's actually cool, really cool with me and my wife, and he, um, he's like, he found out because we're recently we're 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 having a baby in about two months. We made the announcement a couple weeks ago, and he's like, dude, and he just called oh, us, and like, dude, you guys, congratulations, let me send you guys something. Like, uh, Rui's awesome. <laughs> that's the that's the opposite of my reaction when people say they're having a baby. I'm like, oh, my condolences. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> but uh, congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. But uh, what was it like working on uh, such a historic franchise? Which is crazy because uh, I'm gonna get back to the question. I just want to I want to get this out real quick. It's crazy how Ease is such a historically like, in my opinion, it's, it's a very historically prominent franchise that a lot of people still are not aware of it. Like, Or people think it's like a Zelda. I've I've heard a lot of Nintendo fans say, "Oh, it's just a Zelda knockoff." I'm like, it's all it's literally just as old. Yeah, it's not at all actually, <laughs> and uh, not at all like a Zelda. That's why yeah. I'm like, I don't get that. I uh, so we did East Origin with Diamond Mew on PlayStation Four and Vita back in the day, and that was our first like one of our first collector's editions. And I remember the biggest thing is a lot of people deemed us on the art book. It wasn't as good as it should have been, and you know, we were new. We didn't really know what we were doing. We kind of tried our best to do what we thought worked. Um, so it was great to do the recent version of it for Switch because we got to redo the collector's edition and mm-hmm. kind of uh, make up for everything that happened with the last time. Um, and like you said, it's a it's a very well respected series. It has you know, I'm excited for nine. Uh, eight was great. Um, Did you play the demo? I haven't yet. Everybody keeps asking me. I uh, Dude, it's so good. Every- Everybody thinks I have like infinite free time, and you're right, I do usually. But no, <laughs> but, but instead I'm replaying Mass Effect One for some weird reason. Um, but yeah, I want to play it, and uh, East has been great. I, I remember when we got it, I was like, "Holy crap, this is such a great game!" Um, like the origin, even. And then uh, mm-hmm. after that, it kind of Josh was already like well established to do what they were, um, and it, us working with it kind of opened the door for me. And I think that's probably what's going to happen with each release is it's going to continue to grow more and more of the audience is finally going to realize it. And hopefully nine does like an even better job. Cause I feel like eight really opened the door. Yeah. Like, There's so many people that I never expected to play the game suddenly playing it because eight was so real respected, you know, minus the original uh, translation. But yeah, the, the people that just got into it, didn't know the translation was bad. Uh, yeah. And they fixed it. So yeah, it, East is great. Dotting is great. We did Streets of Rage with them. We've done multiple games with them. They're great partners. Surreal, who heads that stuff up, is a great guy. He has beautiful hair. Um, <laughs> we're always jealous because he's just so suave. I'm like, I hope he hears this. Um, <laughs> and he loves American breakfast food. That's like his thing to do anytime we see him. Um, yeah, they're great people, and he's a huge fan of games too. Like, and it, it just it's it coalesces so well. Like to know that we're both doing this because we love it. It's not just a, a fin- financial reason. That, that that will be like off topic. Another jarring thing about getting into the game industry is finding out how many people you thought were like huge, like true game people that are actually just suits. So I've, I've, I've run into that. It's, that's... it's nice when you get somebody that's passionate because you're like, thank you. And then, you, yeah. but you it's surprising how many people they're there just for the financial reasons or to like make shareholders happy. And that's it. Yeah, that um, I, I I start seeing a lot of that when I started being able to go to more and more events like within the last couple of years, uh, like especially because I got flown out to E3 last year by PDP and at E3, I got to see a lot of that, especially, you know, the outside parties that they had, like you got the you got the E3, the showroom floor, and then you got the one where. You know, you go to the bars or wherever they're doing the after party, and, and that's where a lot of business is conducted. And I got to see a lot of people are just suits, and I was like, "Oh, okay, yeah." That's how that's how it was with us. Like when we started getting bigger and 
heavy medians and more prominent uh, publishers and stuff, you just find out that like it's usually suits and E3 and GDC are the two biggest ones like that. Like we booked, we actually booked a meeting room at the last E3, which that's 2019 now, which is God, so far away. I, uh, <laughs> which was exciting because we got to have our own like room to show people stuff. Um, but mm -hmm. like I said, it's just a lot of suits walking in. I mean, a lot of people wearing suits just to look nice, but then they are, you know, yeah. the figurative suit as well. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, I remember conventions, man. Those were fun. Yeah, I know, right? Especially LA. I loved LA. Like, we love going to, there's a lot of retro shops near the convention center. And we'll ride the little scooters there. We even had a scooter accident that was pretty brutal. Um, I got a ticket riding a scooter. Out. <laughs> a ticket? I got For a what? ticket at E3. Because apparently, I was, I guess you're not supposed to be riding it on the sidewalk, but we were all, all we saw oh. the people riding it on the sidewalk. Yeah, there's what? Yeah, there's tons of people on the sidewalk. You can't. There's a lot of places where you can't get in the street. That's how we. Yeah. That's how we crashed. We tried to go into the street to get around someone, and a car showed up out of nowhere, and we crashed into each other. It was pretty brutal. But then we got back on them and just kept riding. Well, we got new scooters because those. On, I don't think those worked anymore. It was pretty bad. <laughs> like, it's embarrassing too to think that I crashed on a scooter. But now it's funny. Oh yeah, I was like scraped up to hell. I was like limping for the rest of the event. Those scooters, oh, man. What was the 2019? Oh, Josh and I, yeah. Josh and I were at night following our uh, art director, Shaddy, and he was like doing some weird stuff going around people. And we went off the ramp as well to like go around people. And a car showed up, and we both went to go left, but one of us went faster than the other. And it like suddenly he's flying over me, and I'm like skidding across the street. <laughs> like, the scooters are beeping because they don't work anymore, and we're just like panicking. We're like, "Wow, we almost died!" And like, oh. but then, but then you're like, oh, "I'm in LA, so it's like not much I can do about it. Let's just get another scooter and keep going." And Basically, <laughs> those things were lifesavers at E3 because like our hotel wasn't far away, but it was far enough to where like there was no way to get an Uber without like waiting for forever. So it was like, just scoot your way to E3. Dude, the, the funny thing about that, so <clears throat> nobody told me. What, you know, and going to E3 to like get like a either try to get a hotel, which you know, I should know, get a hotel months in advance is closer to the convention center or to get a Airbnb. So, my wife and I, we went out there last year. Well, no, 2019. I want, I want why do I want to? Yeah, it's still not the new year yet. It feels weird. <laughs> it's so, still so, March, right? So, so when we went uh, 2019, um, we got our hotel by the ours is by the airport and we were thinking oh we just catch the uber there it's only going to take about 10 15 minutes i was an hour from the from the the hotel to the convention center and then yeah uh, yeah because we got we landed at we land so we landed at seven we had to go pick up our tickets at nine. We went to the hotel. We're like, oh, yeah, it'll be fine. Couldn't check in. But they let us leave our bags there. So then we're like, okay, we're going to go to the convention center, get our, our, our passes. So we were like, oh, that's not going to take long. Took an hour. So we got there at nine, got our passes. And then we're like, okay, we got a call from the, the hotel. They're like, oh, you can check in now. Like, all right, well, it's not going to take long. Took us an hour to go back. Got there. Couldn't. <laughs> God, could not check in until 4 p.m. I oh, yeah, there's sticklers on that. They, yeah, so we, we had that problem. Too. About that. So, like, the whole first day of E3, we missed it. But, like, er each other day, like, we were able to make up for it because we had the pass so we can skip a lot of the lines. But, man, anyone who's gonna, if there ever is another E3 or convention, plan ahead. Just, just know that, and and wear shoes that are comfortable because you're going to do a lot of walking. Because uh, yeah, people did not prep me for it. They're like, oh, just wear business casual attire. And I'm like, well, okay, sneakers, slacks, what? Oh yeah, just wear slacks and all that. Have a have a really good budget for water because you need to stay hydrated. It gets hot. Yeah. yeah. I uh, <laughs> at 2019 E3, we showed up and they wouldn't let us into the hotel until a certain time. And then like the lady, we rented an apartment because there was three of us and uh. Mm -hmm. lady wouldn't show up forever and then she finally does we get in there and like the air doesn't work yep and then uh 
the water in the shower in my shower, you know, it worked fine for everyone else in the other shower, but the shower I had to use it only was cold. So, what? So on one hand, it's like great because like there's no heat or there's no air conditioning, so I can jump in the shower and it's freezing cold. But the other hand, it's freezing cold, so like mm. it's extremely uncomfortable, and I feel like I'm about to die every time I take a shower. But uh, it was rough, and then like. I had a really bad headache, and I asked my friend to get me some Tylenol, and he got me Tylenol PM and didn't tell me, and I almost took it, and that was almost scary, and like, it was just a weird trip. And then the scooter accident, that all being said, though, we had a lot of fun. We just tried to stay out of the hotel as much as possible and scoot everywhere. Went to a lot of, par- a lot of parties, ended up in Skid Row once by accident. And, uh, Same here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's surprisingly easy to end up in Skid Row. Like You yeah. don't try. <laughs> and you're just there. Dude, we were so like that's supposed to be the E3 after party, and they're like, "Oh, it's over in this area." So we we gave it to the uh, we called an Uber over there, and then we're like, "Wait, wait, wait, this zone looks safe." <laughs> like, uh, where are we at? Oh, and then the, the Uber driver's like, "Oh, this is Skid Row." And I'm like, "This is where I'm, we were looking out." We're like, "No, we're not going there." No. <laughs> yeah, it's. We had a couple of Ubers drive through it too, and we're just like, "This is this is crazy." Some of the people though in Skid Row had some good setups. This one guy had a tent. And he had like a computer setup and like a grill. And I was like, "Holy crap!" He has like he had really nice equipment too. We we're like, "I don't know, this guy's doing pretty okay." Um, <laughs> but it was it was very interesting, and it's like you said, it's it's so surprising how easy it is to get there. Yeah, I don't know if you noticed this. We have another theory. I know we're going over time, but. Uh, there's, no, 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 go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> there's like the hot dog mafia at E3. I'm it like, it is. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> Josh and I just kept making up things about like what, because we, we walked by one of the buildings and there was just like hot dogs on the ground. And we're like, oh no, somebody got taken out. And we we're like, <laughs> it's like, they're all selling the same thing and there's so many of them. And you're like, this can't be real. Like, this has to be like a money laundering thing. And like, I don't know, it's sketchy. Super sketchy, and they're like everywhere, especially yeah, like, dude. yeah, yeah. He's he's hearing me. He's like, yeah, you come out of an alley, and they just show up with hot dogs. Right. There's like, there's never just one of them either. There's like three or f- three to five at a time in one spot, just showing up, and they're like hot dog, and you're like, no, I don't want your street cook hot dog. Like, this isn't like when you're outside of a courthouse, like where it looks at least a little proper. You have like right? a. A, a grill that I don't know how it's being heated. <laughs> like, ugh, it's just cooking in the LA sun. I know, right? Like, there's a lot of this stuff we saw, and they're like, and then the prices too. Like, I'm looking at the price of it, and I'm, I'm looking at it. I'm like, yeah, I'll just go back into the convention center and buy something there. Even this, I mean, stuff in there is overpriced too, but at least I know is is adhering to some some type of food regulation. But that stuff outside, I was like. <laughs> I don't even know what that meat is. I, uh, <laughs> right? <laughs> I always try to warn people at E3. I'm like, yeah, you need to stay really hydrated, but also prepare to have a very large amount of money saved up just to be able to buy drinks at E3. Because it's like yeah. so overpriced. But if you don't stay hydrated, you're just, you're not going to make it. Definitely. Oh, I, I do have a couple, a uh, few, few final questions that, you know, I, I want to be completely respectful of your time. I'm having a great time here, you know, <laughs> lo- loving this, this conversation we're having. But one of the questions um, I definitely want to ask, because I know with, and I think this is just an industry issue, but like, how do you guys like work to prevent scalpers getting games and stuff away from fans that want to buy your like is that a, I know that's a battle for everybody. I mean, we clearly saw this with the, the new generation of consoles that came out. That's been for all intents and purposes a shit show dealing with them, you know, dealing with uh scalpers. But how do you guys do it? So yeah, we we definitely have our fair share. It's it's a it's like a it's like a balance in the ecosystem. Like you need resellers to like be there to, you know, help drive the market as well as you know, be there for people that missed out, but you also want to make sure you have enough for the people that are intentionally buying the game to like either, you know, for a forever home, as I, I like to call it. Like when I mm-hmm. tell people like, Hey, I'm interested in getting this and it, I don't want it to sell it. I want to own it myself. Um, now plenty of our fans are like that. So we do our best to try to combat that. We've, we've had different tactics. Like early on, a lot of people would say like, Oh, your game sold out because of scalpers. And then you go on eBay and it's like, that makes up not even a full percentage of the sales. Like, 
there aren't as many scalpers as you think there are. Mm -hmm. That being said, there have been times, though, on a few releases, such as like the Jack and Daxter releases, where we literally saw the sneaker crowd infiltrate the games. And like, we found one of their groups on like Facebook and Twitter, and they were like teaching each other how to like what to look for and what to shop for and like what the values were. And I was like, holy crap. Thankfully, they're all very easy signs because they use bots and those show up as fraud. Um, so mm -hmm. we can kind of filter through and we do our best to, to like enforce like the, you know, only this many per household and we can pull up all the addresses and see whoever has double or triple. Um, you know, we always have the occasional guy that somehow manages to get 20 and we usually track them down before it's too late. Um, and then we have classic cases. Like we have some people on eBay that no matter what we do or the research we do, they somehow still end up with way more than they should. And it's mm -hmm. the only way I can imagine this is happening is they have multiple people helping them because there's yeah. just, we've ordered from them to try to like, you know, triangulate their address. That's another thing we do. We'll order some games from some of these scalpers so we can figure out who they are and prevent them. But I don't want to prevent people that follow the rules. So like, for example, if you wanted to show up to our site and buy all our S and K releases with the, with the idea that you were going to resell them, as long as I, if I said they're one to two per household and you follow the rules, it's not my, it's not my responsibility or even my right to like see what you're doing post sale. Yeah. Like, I would hope that you're not reselling these, but it, I can't force you to do something. Yeah. So, and like I said, I think it helps balance the market. Like if somebody missed out because like they're out of town or didn't know about it or whatever, there's at least a reseller. And theoretically, you know, at some point that price will be a reasonable price. Yeah. Like yeah. there's plenty of Mondo posters that I've missed out on and I have to go to like eBay to get them. And, you know, it just kind of depends on when you're looking and who's being fair. Yeah. Yeah, the people definitely have to understand market appreciation values because eventually it it's going to it has to level itself uh, after a while. But I am glad I got Grandia too. I'm just wait. I'm so mad at USPS because <laughs> for a while there they kind of lost my my package, and then I just got a notification like, okay, it's in North Carolina. I'm like, what? It's supposed to be oh. a while ago. But yeah, even know. in that. Because I, I, I made a tweet about that, and some some folks are like, "Oh, you know, it's the fall limited run games." I'm like, "No, it's not." I'm like, "That's that's that's the carrier." Like, yeah, that's uh, that's not even like unheard of right now. Especially, I have so many things I've ordered from other places that have just the tracking has either stopped or yeah. it just disappeared, and then it like weeks later it'll update and be like it's on the way again. And I'm like, "What the hell?" That happened to a couple of my wives' uh, wives, wow, just not multiple wives. I don't want her to hear that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. a couple of my wife's presents uh, i ordered one like a month and a half in advance of christmas and it didn't arrive until after but yeah. the mail system is just like rough right now yeah yeah so so um uh let's see what else, what else i got for you what else i got i think i have uh so Let's see how how much of this can we dive into? What are some of your your plans or uh, limited run games as plans for twenty twenty one? I almost said twenty twenty. To... <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, some of our big twenty twenty one plans are uh, we announced that we have a Japanese office last year. Um, hoping to you know bridge more into that. That's also going to help us with bringing more games over here, um, and then bringing some titles that we think do well in Japan uh, from here to there. We're going to have the retail store open at some point this year, which is going to be a huge thing for us. And if it's successful, we would love to maybe put one on the West Coast at some point. That's a long-term goal. Um, we've been you know, talking about doing Europe for a really long time. We would hope that this year is the year we can start work on that. Um, like having not only an office there to help with just you know learning more about how games work in Europe, but also help with shipping. But you know, a lot of the stuff we're seeing, it's going to be about the same that we're dealing with here. Um, mm -hmm. we have a lot of big releases planned. Uh, we have a lot more like retro stuff coming out. Like we've been doing a lot of games in Natsume lately. We have scat coming out on uh, Friday from mm -hmm. when this podcast was recorded. And then we have, uh, a lot, yeah, a lot more stuff. And then we're, uh, Jeremy Parrish is working on a book for us. Um, it's going to be pretty cool. We're, we're diving into more and more media. We have more vinyls coming out. Um, and some other cool things we're working on. I, uh, like I said, I legitimately think this is going to be our biggest year ever. And, it's going to be weird to try and say that next year. If we do another year of podcast, I will be surprised if I'm able to say that again. 
Okay. Obviously, I mean, that's the hope. <laughs> We you definitely will be coming on the show again. <laughs> we'll definitely love to have you back on. Um, so so um, one of the other things, like I know you guys work a lot with uh, various influencers. I've seen you guys do collaborations with Dig- Digital Emulus and you know GameSack and others. Like, what what is the process? Uh, if there are influencers out there that would like to work with you, guys, like what are the things you guys look for in influencers or creators? Um, creators? I mean, picking influencers. So, for the longest time, uh, influencer stuff was mostly driven by me, um, just because we didn't have a lot of bandwidth to kind of deal with it. And mm-hmm. I remember early on when I was asking influencers, I originally was coming up with deals like, "Hey, as long as you're promoting us, you can have all our games for free." And people would be like, "Well, I want money," and I was like, "Well, oh, no, we just started, and the games are selling out. I don't really need you to do this. It's more of like..." I wanted to work with you because I'm a fan, but now that I know you want money from me, it's a little weird. Um, but there's a lot of that I've seen. <laughs> yeah, and I, I get it if it makes sense. But this, this person that I don't even remember the name of anymore, uh, really, really want it didn't make sense. So I was like, "Why are you demanding money?" Um, mm-hmm. But what we look for is kind of people like the biggest thing I think overlap for us is uh, anybody in the collecting scene. So, like, Metal Jesus Rocks has been great. Um, mm-hmm. Kelsey Lewin's been great. She was on the his show a lot, but now she, you know, helps co-run the Game History Foundation. Uh, mm-hmm. She has her own retail store in Seattle. A couple, actually. And she's Thrill, been great. Yeah. Yep. Those are really cool stores to go in. Um, and yeah, we just, like, you know, I'm friends with Woods from Woods Beat'em Up. Um, I met him when he just started a long, long time ago, and a lot, a lot of the influencers that I like to work with are people that I generally get along with and already like, uh, and people that are, you know, like actual, like, ah, that's a weird gatekeeping term, actual gamers. Like, I, people that seem passionate about it. Like, it's not just like, oh, games are a popular thing to do YouTube on. I'm going to do it. I, uh, there's a lot of that. Yeah. <laughs> it's like you said earlier i see the the youtuber drama or influencer drama and i'm just sitting there like wolf i'm glad i'm not involved and uh <laughs> but yeah I, that's kind of what we look for you know i obviously you want somebody with a good amount of subscribers or followers but it's not always the case sometimes i'll i'll you know take a gamble and say tell my marketing team like hey pick a few people that are maybe not as big but they seem passionate or their videos are very well done like maybe they're going to be the next big thing and it'd be great to get in like early so that like we can establish a good relationship. Mm-hmm. Um, that's the kind of stuff we look for. We don't, we just, it's really hard. It's better now because we have the, the marketing team handles it and they have the bandwidth to do it. Um, and they're building a new program out. But that was the biggest thing really was we weren't necessarily trying to stop working with influencers or make it to where it was hard. It was just more that we didn't have the time. Because mm-hmm. it would mean that like me or somebody else would have to stop what they're doing to like get all this stuff sorted out. And we have, like I said earlier, we wear a lot of hats, so it's like it's hard to just kind of like all of a sudden put on that other hat. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. I mean, I'm it, it, our our, uh, our community manager put out a call the other day on Twitter about how you know if you're an influencer or somebody like please reach out and we'll take a we'll review your account and see if you're a good fit for us because you want to expand. And it's definitely, you know, the, well, doing YouTube for five years. I've seen a lot. I've seen a lot of being careful with my words, you know, interesting individuals. <laughs> I've seen a lot of people that are in, you know, covering games or doing gaming YouTube where they they actually do love games. Like, there's a lot of people I know that are. You know, like I'm, I'm friend. I'm really, really good friends with uh, Adam Korlick. You know, that's, that's oh, Adam's friends. awesome. Yeah, that's one of my best friends. And you know, shout out met, to him. And, I met him in Missouri, which was like a very, very. It was Mo Game Con, which is like a smaller event, and it was surprising the people that went to support it. It was nice to see them, and uh, Adam definitely hung around the booth a lot and chatted with us, and we we clicked right away. And he's a big Sega fan, as you know, and we're big yep. Sega fans, so you know. Yeah, he, it was like um, it's easy. Every time he comes out to Hawaii, he stays at my house, and he's like, "Because I, I, I remember I told him once before, I was like, dude, whenever you come out to Hawaii, just let me know you got a place to stay because we we have a house right next to Waikiki." And he's like, "I'm gonna hold you to that, and I'm gonna show up one day." And I was like, 
What do you mean? He's like, I'm going to show up. I'm going to be at the airport. I'm going to tell you, come get me. I was like, fine. And then he did it. And I was like, oh, you weren't joking. <laughs> Good. Uh, I love that guy. <laughs> yeah, he just, he travels a lot. It's I remember when we first started uh, talking to his friends, he, uh, every day he would message me. He was like, I'm in this place now. And I'm like, holy crap, right? dude. What's the <laughs> I was like, "What's the last time you've seen home?" And he's like, "It's been a couple months." Right. I was like, "All right, good for you, man." I uh, I like going to places, but I don't like the act of going. So yeah, like I hate planes. It's like my that plane trip to Japan from where I'm at is miserable. Like how many hours about, is it? Twenty eight, eighteen if you get the best flight. So it's like six across the U.S. and then twelve across the Pacific. It's rough. It's worth it though, but you lose a whole day like traveling plus the day to like catch up on sleep. I always have to like remind people that have never been like you're not going to be. You know, ideally, you want to be like out ready to go as soon as you get there, but it's, it's you're going to crash and it's going to be worse. Yeah. But yeah, I don't. I don't travel schedule is insane. Good for that guy. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So so is there any um any game or anything you're looking forward to you personally? That you're looking forward to uh, in this year that hasn't already been delayed. There's been a lot of things no. delayed this year. <laughs> oh, I mean the new PSO. I'm looking forward to. I don't remember if that's sitting this year. I feel like it was. We'll see. I uh, there's a game coming out next year. I'm excited for. Even though I'm, I was a little less excited when I figured out more about it. But it's uh, I forgot the name of it. It's the new horror game that's made by the Dead Space creator, but it's in the PUBG universe. Oh, um... The PUBG part is the part that lost me, <laughs> but <laughs> Dead Space being one, about. Dead yeah. Space is one of my faves, so I was really excited. Um, and then obviously, whenever the next Final Fantasy VII comes out, I'll be excited. But we'll see. It'll probably be at the end of the PS5 lifetime. Sorry, guys. Um, I Okay, so in insider information about that because i'm friends with uh uh john bentley the voice of barrett so it's coming sooner than we think okay i had heard they had already been like the work had already been started well before than anybody thought but yeah the history of that team's work yes that's true. does not always go well. <laughs> so you know, this is the I thought 15 was I thought I liked Final Fantasy 15, but it was clear it was somehow still rushed, despite taking forever. And then Kingdom Hearts 3, I am a diehard Kingdom Hearts fan, but 3 really lost me. Nothing had any consequence in that game. It, like, the only story mode part of it was the last hour. And I was like, why am I even, like, doing this adventure with Thor? Like, he doesn't even know what he's doing. How did you feel about the Remind DLC? It was just kind of there. It didn't really add anything for me. I uh, one and two I loved to death, and some of the side games like Birth by Sleep's amazing. I uh, love the story. It's one of those things where I like enjoy trying to tell people what the story was because it's so convoluted. But then by three, it's just like I don't know. I was like, how many Roxases are there at this point? And then like, <laughs> <laughs> like I don't know. And then the ending, like you know, so and so might be dead. Oh, she's not dead. She's somewhere else. And you're like, why though? Why? Why isn't this the definitive end for everything after all this time it took? Like, I don't know. A lot of beefs. I mean, we grew up with this franchise, and it's like the whole thing was they were hyping three. We've been waiting for three for so long. And then when it got here, I, my feelings of it was, this is it? Yeah. Like, you're just going to sequel bait into to another? Okay. <laughs> really? The only thing I'll say for that one is the combat was fun, and yeah. that was about it. It felt like the whole budget went to uh, the Frozen World, which really upset me. Like they're like, this song costs a lot of money, but it's got to be in the game. It was like Tangled World; they didn't even include the main song in that. They like did a different thing over it, and it's like, why? You looked at everything else. Like, why did you skip this part? I don't know. This is weird. That's a whole another podcast. <laughs> <laughs> we could definitely dive into that. But yeah, oh, those are some of the things I'm excited for. And I'm just, uh, there's a bunch of other things too. I uh, have a hard time keeping track of what's coming out because I'm so backlogged as it is. Um, 
yeah, I'm excited to utilize my PS5 and Series Series X more, which you know this year will hopefully prove to be the year for them. Um, and I'm still getting a lot of enjoyment on my Switch. I recently enjoyed the Zelda Age of Calamity. I thought that was a lot of fun. You know, everybody's like the frame rate gets real bad, and I'm like, it's a Dynasty Warrior game. They kind of all do that, but it's I'm hacking and slashing anyway. It's not like it's that critical for me. It's a brain dead game to play, so I don't have to think. Exactly. Isn't it amazing how people, when they think you work in the gaming industry or, or, or with gaming companies, like they think that you have all this time to play games? You really don't. No. You really don't. <laughs> Sometimes because you worked on them, it's like harder for you to enjoy them. Yeah. That happens a lot to our releases, which I'll like love them. And then after we release them, it like reminds me of work. And I have a hard time playing them. So, so is there anything uh, you'd like to leave the audience with before we go? Uh, when's this probably going to be posted? Uh, next week. Next week, Monday. Okay. Um, so but I, I'll, I'll send it to you so you team can go over it if there's anything that needs to... Because it'll be edited. I'll, I'll ed, have an intro and outro and then this part right here, I'll edit that out and then Okay. Uh, well, so what I'd like to say, everyone, is uh, thanks for your support on the 8th of January, and I'm looking forward to seeing everybody's reaction and uh, um, just support on the 15th of January. It's going to be a big day for us, and I'm really looking forward to it. Awesome. Awesome. And uh, where can people find you? They should know already, but for yeah. the in the back that don't, where can they find you? They can find our website at limitedrungames.com where they can also sign up for the mailing list to stay up to date on all new releases. Uh, they can find me personally on Twitter at Limited Run Doug, as well as my co-founder at Limited Run Josh, and then our main Twitter at Limited Run Games. Um, there's also a Twitch if you look it up, an Instagram, Facebook. There was a Tumblr for, as a joke. Um, and if you really, really want it, maybe we'll make a Pinterest. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I was gonna say, man, like trying to do stuff with like Facebook. Do you feel like platform is dying? I left Facebook in 2016 and only use it here and there with another account I made to keep track of business accounts. And I've felt a lot better ever since. Like it's there is so much like psychological damage being done to people on Facebook that they're not aware of. Like being jealous of people or being upset with somebody's views. You know, people argue Twitter is the same thing, but like, at least I know what I'm getting on Twitter and I'm not usually following friends. I'm mostly following like industry people I know or like random celebrities, whereas Facebook, it's like, I don't know. And there's all, yeah, yeah, it's it's people you usually know. And it's like so much drama and I don't know. I I think it's going away for, I don't, it's not going to ever go away, but I think more people, especially in our generation are starting to let go of it. Yeah. Yeah. I um I, I'm getting to so my wife and I we both have Facebook accounts and it's mainly just for our family and, and I I hate saying friends because like I'm trying to think how many of the hundreds of people that are following our friends on Facebook and I'm like the only person I can think of is Adam Corlick because we're, we're friends on there and a couple other voice actors I know that I'm friends with but all these other people are, even ones I went to college with I'm like I haven't talked to you in like 10 15 years so it's like what's the point and then you see people post so much stuff it's like i didn't want to know that about you you know yeah. that's a lot of that i'm like oh, that's the thing okay. too it's like it's like when you run into a friend you haven't seen since high school and like that was 10 15 years ago and they're like we should catch up and it's like should we like we never thought yeah. about this for 15 years is it worth our time to like bother pretending we're friends still like i had a great time with you back then and like that's good enough for me we don't need to like we're adults now and we have a lot of responsibilities. We don't need to try to figure this out. And it's like the same with Facebook. It's like, why am I keeping track of people I've never spoken to like for two decades? Yes. Yeah. It's, I don't know. It's sad. Cause it's like, you realize the order you get, the more you figure out who your true friends are because you're like kind of closing that network. But yeah, it happens. <clears throat> yeah. Especially when, gotta... you, when you start a family and get married, like you're seeing, you're going to, that that's your world at that point it is and like the only people i really even interact with at this point is you know like again adam corlick and like all the people in the industry that i'm cool with or i work with that's it like all the other people i'm like the only time a lot of other people hit like reach out to me is if they want something 
Like a lot of people, like, oh, you get free games. Oh, you get free this. You got free that. Oh, can you connect me in this way? And like, okay, one, it's not technically free because there has to be some type of reciprocation or review or something like that. And like the few people I've actually that I know personally, I've tried to help get into content creating. They, you know, and I helped them get a game or a product for free. Then they're like, yeah, I didn't like it. I'm like, okay, cool. So, uh, where's your review? Where's your your work? And they're like, no, I didn't want to do it. <laughs> I, I so hate like, that. <laughs> it's like okay. Hey, it's the same with me. I I have real friends in the game industry that like. That's the other great thing about the older I've gotten, and with some of my friends that I'm I'm making now or have had for a while. They understand too that they're always busy, so neither one of us feels obligated to constantly keep track of each other. But you know, we know that when we see each other, it's going to be as if you know nothing changed. Like mm-hmm. it's like we just pick up from where we left off. I still have a childhood friend I've known since preschool that I only get to see him like once a year, if that. And my wife always points out it's as if we had never been separated because it's like we mm-hmm. just pick right back up from where we were. Like we haven't changed our fundamental like cores of like who we are with each other. Um, and it's a lot like that with other people too. And it's, those are the people I like to keep around. <laughs> the other way to phrase it, that sounds <laughs> mean, like, I don't want needy people. No, <laughs> no, yeah. but it, it's, it's so hard not to have those type, type of people come around because like it, and I, I actually like, I, I, I feel like this. And, and sometimes I've been told like, Oh, I shouldn't think this way, but I feel like the more I've gotten into this industry and, and, you know, working with the gaming industry, working with tech companies, working, with, you know, celebrities and stuff like that. You get people that, like I said, they always want something. And then you get to a point where it's like you start to second, you know, you, you double think. You're like, are you really trying to talk to me because you're interested or in, in, in like hanging out and catching up? Or do you want something? And then it's like your mind kind of drifts to one area where you're like, how long? you know, till you actually, it, it reveals what you actually want. And I, I feel like I run into that a lot more often than I, I like to admit. And I've had people say, Mikhail, you're jaded. I'm not jaded. I'm just guarded. <laughs> no, I mean, I feel the same way, but I still get called jaded. In some, ways, <laughs> I, in some ways I am. It's like, I've been to so many conventions now. It feels, I feel bad because I'll take someone new and they're like, wow, this is crazy. And I'm just like not looking. I'm just heading straight to the booth because I'm like, yeah. Because <laughs> after a while, you've like, for example, like when Resident Evil Seven was coming out, they would bring Capcom brought the house, mm-hmm. like you could walk through it. But it was at every convention, and it was like, wasn't that cool anymore? By the third or fourth time, you're like, oh, it's the Resident Evil Seven house. Like I've already seen it. Um, mm-hmm. But you know, every once in a while, you see something new that's cool, and then you know the jaded thing goes away because you're like, wow, this is amazing. This is why I'm in the industry. But like it, it's kind of like Groundhog Day at some point. You just kind of yeah. going through the motions. Yeah. Well, all right, man. And that that's the show. We, we wrap it up here because I, I know you got a busy day, and I, I've taken an hour and a half away from you. <laughs> you could have been doing some other important stuff, man. You just sitting here, you know, shooting the shit with me. I appreciate it. Though. I appreciate you coming uh, on the show. I, I appreciate it. it. Did you? It was have a nice. It? Yeah, it was a nice distraction. <laughs> yeah for, the, so, for those that don't know what's going on this was a friday or no this is a wednesday where the hell am i <laughs> <laughs> it feels it's, like a friday though it's wednesday january 6th on this podcast and the world is kind of crazy right now and uh this was nice it was really nice to just chat with someone yeah you know and, and this episode of the podcast along with every other podcast will be available on Several platforms if you want in video format, and you can catch it on youtube.com slash Mikel Casanova and twitch.tv slash Mikel Casanova. In audio format, you can catch it on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, iHeartRadio, Pandora, and we just recently got on Amazon Music. Amazon reached out to us to get our show on there, so we're over there. So catch us over there, the Casanova Podcast. If you want to support the podcast, we have Patreon as well, so patreon.com slash Mikel Casanova. Everything you guys invest in us, we reinvest into the platform and, you know, streams, giveaways, and all that. And uh, links for everything, for my guests, as well as limited run games, will be down in the description below. And, uh, yeah, go support. Go follow. 
start some more fantasy star talk because i really i feel like we could do a whole episode of that no okay yeah let me do my uh my outro yeah so uh that's <laughs> it we'll catch you guys <laughs> i'm so sidetracked uh we'll catch you guys on the deck so this is uh doug and myself we are signing out you guys have a great one thank you so much for tuning in to this episode i hope it was informative engaging and you enjoyed it and if you did make sure you go ahead and leave a rating and a review it greatly helps out the podcast and helps the platforms that we're on go ahead and promote us more so that more people can check it out and if you're wondering what all platforms we're on aside from what you've listened to it on we're available on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, Pandora, Spotify, Amazon Music, and more. And if you want to support the podcast, then we've got Patreon, so patreon.com slash Mikhail Casanova, which allows us to continue doing what we're doing. If you're looking for this in video format, we're also available on twitch.tv slash Mikhail Casanova, as well as youtube.com slash Mikhail Casanova. So with all that being said, I'll catch you on the next episode of Hawaii's number one podcast and the number one podcast in the Pacific, the Casanova Podcast. You have a great day, and I'll see you on the next one. Bye.